Hello everyone. It's early morning for me, but I realize it's evening for most of you. Am I right? I have all different time zones I know I'm talking to, so I just had my first cup of tea, but I think <laughs> I can manage to give you a pretty coherent show. <laughs> Our company works with recyclers all over the world, but of course mainly in the U.S. and Canada and in Latin America, but we also have clients in Australia and Asia and India and Africa and some in the EU. And we help people prepare for certifications, in particular the ISO 14001, which is the environmental certification, OSAS 18001, which is changing to ISO 45001, which is health and safety, and R2 or e sewers, which are standards that are just for our industry and include a lot of best management practices. But on top of that, we also help people evaluate their compliance needs and make sure that they're meeting either the regulations in their country and or province or state, as well as just general good health and safety activities for protecting workers and the environment around them. So if the country doesn't have very strict environmental health and safety regulations, we help them find what are just considered the basic international good management practices for protecting workers and the environment when you're an electronics recycler or refurbisher. So I think that's why Elizabeth thought it would be helpful for me to come speak to you guys. We met in the Philippines this year. So I just want to make sure that you sort of understand basic environmental health and safety requirements globally. Know where you can find resources for information about requirements in your area, but also learn ways to manage and track requirements and risks. And I want to start out by saying you'll have my email and this presentation. If you ever need any help, you're welcome, as part of my commitment to Elizabeth and to all of you, to reach out to me with questions if you need any help, but also ideas things that you guys are doing or examples or photographs because I like to share that with other people too. So you'll have some contact information I know that that's available to you. So when we're looking at requirements for our operations, we're looking at the entire facility. When I first started as a compliance operator, maybe it was 1997, so a long time ago, that tells you I'm old. but Part of the way I looked at the facility was everything that I was responsible for that could be damaged or hurt or affected by our operation. So I looked at water, how our operation affected water, the air, and the soil, whether we generated any hazardous materials or waste as part of our process, what the health and safety requirements would be or what best management practices would be for health and safety, meaning protecting our workers, any fire safety codes, or if there were no regulations in the area we were operating, what made sense from a fire safety perspective, and also regulations on handling CRT glass, but the dangers of CRT glass. So we always are looking at not just our country's regulation, but also regulations that might be in smaller provinces or smaller governmental agencies, so states, local governments, counties, provinces, provincial information. And then I also really suggest that you work with local enforcement agencies if you have them and they're open to coming to visit you because they're often a wealth of information. I know sometimes we're not so excited to invite them to our facilities, but building a partnership with them is really helpful if they're open to that and have the time to come meet you. So when we look at international requirements, we're really looking mostly at import and export laws. And that starts with the Basel Treaty. I suggest everyone take a look at that online and just Google it. It guides international import and export regulations in, in, um, when it comes to hazardous materials, which is things like circuit boards, mercury bulbs, batteries, CRT glass. And those are the things within our industry that we end up using a lot or when we dismantle electronics that we get down to. And the Basel Treaty says how you can import and export them. 
we also want to look at individual country import or export laws. So some countries don't follow the Basel Treaty or do follow the Basel Treaty, so that's something you'll want to know if you're doing import and exporting. There are also border crossing requirements for transporter movement. For example, as a, somebody in the U.S., if I want to send material to the EU and it's considered a yellow or orange hazardous waste with the Basel Treaty, I have to fill out information that tells that asks my government to talk to the government of the country to whom I'm shipping material, and I have to show that I have permission to do that. And then we also have local, city, county, and state or province laws that we need to think of as well. So local government laws are often some are often either not existent or more strict. It depends on the country you're in, but they're going to be looking at things like how you protect your community what their regulations are in regards to any hazardous materials. And again, when we're talking about hazardous materials in our industry, we're usually talking about mercury bulbs, different types of batteries, especially lithium batteries nowadays, CRT glass, printed circuit boards. And then we also wonder when we're looking at our local regulations, what the landfill regulations are. So what are we allowed to put in the landfill what's legal to put in the landfill. Not to mention, if we are sending something to a landfill, we might want to visit the landfill and see what their practices are. And we'll talk a little bit about that moving forward. Uh, we also need to know about if our local government has any manifest or export requirements, meaning if we're going to export material like I spoke earlier, what kind of paperwork do we need to fill out and who do we need to notify? Are there any stormwater? So if we have outside operations, is that something we need to consider and are there regulations pertaining to that? And when I say stormwater, I mean if you have outside operations and it's raining, how is that water hitting the material and exposing the water that runs off into the creeks and rivers and streams? How do we manage that? Are there any regulations around that? And if not, what are best management practices for that? Same for air emissions requirements. If we're doing any shredding or crushing or breaking up of units, what does that look like? Because we know there are a lot of toxics in the materials that we manage, but they're pretty well kept intact and we don't really have to worry about it until we start breaking them apart. Oops, there we go. So when we look at health and safety, we might have reporting requirements to our government or workplace requirements. Some countries have air monitoring requirement and noise monitoring requirements, may, meaning that they have what they're called, what are called personal exposure limits for the amount of noise you're allowed to make and expose employees to. So sometimes we see that when we're doing shredding or if we're using hammers and crowbars to tear apart units or break off the back of CRT glass the noise level over an eight hour period of time is sometimes so loud that it starts to damage employees' hearing abilities. So those are one of the things we think about. And then air monitoring is something we do when we're breaking apart circuit boards or tearing apart flat screen TVs in, in case we're accidentally breaking some of those little mercury bulbs in the back or tearing apart or breaking CRT glass and releasing the lead and the chromium and other materials that is on the inside coating of the panel. So we're looking at whether or not we have any exposures to things, loud noises and chemicals. We also look at how we manage accident and injuries. Do we try to prevent them? Are we looking for ways in our operation to keep them from happening? Do we give employees things like Kevlar gloves maybe if they're managing CRT glass to keep them from getting cuts or are we giving them eye shields to prevent them if we're breaking things open with hammers, pre prevent things from maybe going their eyes, or dust masks to keep them from breathing in toxics. We also look at fire protection. And that's something that I see people miss a lot. And I, it really depends on the country what the regulations are and if everybody's regulating you, but if nobody's regulating you, it's going to be up to you to think about those things and sort of get your mind around possible fire issues in your facility. So often the things I see are exit doors that are blocked or that don't have a light. So if the electricity goes off and you're in a really big building and there's no light, 
how would your employees know where the exit doors are? Or if the handles are locked, say you don't let anybody come in from the outside so you have a secure building, but you've locked the handles and then there's a fire and your employees can't see the doors, how are they going to unlock it? How do they have access to keys if there's no lighting to show them how to unlock the door? So we have something called a quick release handle in many countries. What kind of suppression or emergency management do you have? Do you have fire extinguishers or access to water to quickly put out a fire? What's your local response time if you do have a fire brigade close by? How long will it take them to get there? Where do you meet when your employees are trained? So when you have a fire, you need to have drills and pretend you're having a fire so that you know where to meet if there's a fire and a way to check to make sure all of your workers are accounted for. One of the things that happens when you have a fire is that usually everybody gets nervous and runs home and then the fire brigade doesn't know whether or not that person's still in the building. So how do you make sure as a company owner or manager that you've, number one, gotten all of your employees out of the building, but number two, you're accountable to them for the fire department so they don't rush in to try to save somebody that already went home. And then if you do any welding or burning or brazing on site, how you make sure that that doesn't spark any combustion. And then lastly and importantly, how do you manage electrical wiring? Is it done in a way that's safe and you know isn't going to cause a fire? Is it protected? If there is a fire, often I see electrical panels on walls that have materials stacked up against them. And that way you wouldn't be able to get to a fire if there was an electrical fire at the power box. So you want to make sure that you have enough space around those. So if you see a spark or a fire or an explosion, you don't have a bunch of combustible cardboard cartons or something near that electrical unit so that you, the fire will keep going. So sometimes, depending on the country you're in, you might have local fire agencies and they might come once a year. We have that in the US and Canada. It depends where you are. They also like to come when you're building a new building or coming into a building for the first time. So say you rent a building and you're getting ready to occupy it, sometimes it's good to have the fire department come, if you have one, and ask them what their recommendations are for you in terms of exiting the building, managing fires, what's your response time to local agencies, So we talk a little bit again about the international regulations around import and export and the Basel Convention. The Basel Convention has 170 countries that are parties of it. It's intended to prevent the dumping of hazardous waste in developing countries. So for example, it would not be fair for somebody in the US or in Canada to send material to a developing country for them to manage it on a level that wouldn't be as strict as the laws from the country that's sending it to them. So for example, you cannot burn, openly burn electronics in the US, but if I sent them to a country where that could occur, that's disallowed under the Basel Treaty because we're trying to make sure that all electronics are managed in a way that keep a standard of environmental health and safety that all of us are comfortable with so that we make sure we're not polluting our environment. In reality, non-OECD countries cannot legally accept hazardous waste from OECD countries without a bilateral agreement. However, we know it occurs all the time because there are not Basel inspectors that sit at ports. Uh, I once had somebody say to me, I just can't believe that this country is accepting this material from the US. And I said, have you ever been to the port in Shenzhen? There's millions and millions of containers arriving a day and nobody knows what's inside them. But it's important to know what the regulations are because at some point somebody could become better at enforcement and you could end up in a situation where I have a friend right now that's looking at some serious jail time in the US because he sent flat screen TVs to Hong Kong for dismantling and the company that was dismantling them was leaving the mercury bulbs all over the ground. So he actually is in trial in, in April, and he'll know whether or not he's going to spend some time in prison in the US. So the Basel Treaty has, is, their definition of hazardous waste is a little different from our rules in the US, but the knowledge of importing and, and transiting countries is really important. 
and it'll vary among countries. So I, I suggest if you import or export any electronic material, that you make sure you go to the Basel website and look up the countries you're thinking of importing or exporting to or from. And also look at shipments for repair and refurbishment because those are really important to make sure that if you're sending tested working equipment or tested or non-working equipment, that it's legal to export it from the country that you live in and legal to import into the country you're sending it to. So when we're looking at this big picture, we've talked about health and safety, we've talked about fire safety, we've talked about environmental issues, and we've talked about export regulations and import regulations. Where do you start as a facility person? How, how do you even begin to get your arms around this? The way we do it is we actually use a structure within ISO, but you can also do a much simpler version. And when I say ISO, that's the international standard, 14,000 and 18,000. But what we use is a, a method that sort of methodically identifies all of the risks and requirements. It's a method that manages and keeps current the requirements. Because not only do we do a one-time version of reviewing everything that we should be doing, but we also want to make sure that as our, our uh, operation changes, or regulations change or the material receive, we receive changes that we're keeping on top of that to make sure that we're updating those requirements for ourselves. So when we talk about having an environmental health and safety management system, we have a policy and then we have a system to manage the risks. And you can have an informal version of that. I'm just giving you an overview of an international standard way to manage it. So this way is it's sort of an overview system. It manages environmental and health and safety all in one system. And what we're really looking at are what we call aspects and impacts. So how do, what are the things that we do on site that impact environmental health and safety? Whenever you have an aspect, which might be something like, um, you know, we have the possibility to pollute stormwater if we store, say, mercury bulbs outside, we talk about what controls we'll put in place to monitor that possibility. And when we talk about controls, we're saying things that might keep it from polluting the environment. So an aspect is always defined as an element of the organization's activities or services that can interact with the environment. So using the example of, say, flat screen TVs, you're tearing them down outside, you have some small little mercury bulbs in there, you break some of those, they fall on the ground, there you have a possibility of leaving mercury vapor or mercury gases or solid state mercury on the ground which can get in the groundwater or get traipsed around on people's shoes and they take it home. So these are some of the things that an aspect can be. It could be dust from a shredder, noise from an equipment, Wastewater from cleaning floors, <clears throat> something that affects your stormwater, something as simple as how you use natural resources to power your facility, electricity, gas, water, whatever it is that you use to, to generate power at your site. And then any of the waste that you create from your facility, things that you aren't able to recycle. Sometimes, depending on where you live, that might be plastic wrap, broken pallets, at this point, even plastics from some of the computers were unable to recycle because the markets have closed in China. So an aspect has an impact on our environment, and an impact is a change to the environment, whether it's adverse or beneficial, resulting from our aspects. So that's why we say aspects and impacts. And often impacts are adverse in our industry. So we have air pollution, which reduces our air quality, noise pollution, which just is a reduction of your quality of life, water pollution, meaning that we're ruining the water table, so our water quality goes down, land contamination, which is the example I gave you about mercury escaping from the bulbs, and then just the, redu the reduction of natural resources. So if we use a lot of gas or electricity, the re we're taking away from the community's availability of those resources. 
but then it can also be beneficial, and we know this because that's why we're proud of our business, right? We're doing recycling. We're keeping material out of the landfill. We're taking things that are hazardous and making them be reused again, which are the things we're proud of. We also can conserve water by making sure we're recycling plastic so we, need, we don't need to use water to make new plastic. Or we're conserving resources by keeping metals above the ground. We don't have to mine to get the gold and platinum, cadmium and beryllium. We're keeping that above ground and we're mining from existing resources as opposed to digging back in the ground. And we're also reducing landfill space for things that really need to be landfilled. So we know that some of the aspects of our industry are beneficial to our environment. So again, just to reiterate sort of the process of how we evaluate our industry and what, how we affect our environment, an aspect and an impact. So the aspect would be the dust and the shredding process, and the impact would be the reduction of air and soil quality. Noise, diminished quality of life. Odor in the shred process, diminished air quality. Use of electricity, reduction of a resource. So we're looking sort of like from a global level at our, at our business, at our industry, and thinking about the things that we do, which are the aspects, and how it impacts the environment and health and safety. And we think about them for all types of things, our normal everyday operations, but also if we have a fire and a spill. Lately, there's a lot of conversation in our industry about lithium batteries, how we store them on site, um, what happens if we have fires, how volatile they are, um, the whole concept of thermal combustion, how in the lithium batteries, once they heat up, they get hotter and hotter and they can get up to 1,200 degrees. So as an aspect and an impact, when we look at just the handling of lithium batteries alone, we need to think about emergency processes. We also look at historical issues. Maybe we came to a site and it was already contaminated. How do we manage that or how do we protect ourselves at least from risk for a site that was already had past activities at it that we didn't affect? And then how do we look at not only the past but our current and any planned activities and how we're going to manage those from an environmental health and safety standpoint? So. The concept is to kind of just take a look at the whole operation as a whole and think about all of these things as part of your process. So when we look at environmental aspects, again, we're looking at dust and noise, potential for fire, and the generation of hazardous waste. So when we have shredders, we usually have bag house filters and dust, if you have a shredder. And when we're breaking down CRTs, we have the potential for lead dust emissions, generation of hazardous waste, and degradation to air, water, and soil. Because you know that CRTs not only have a lot of lead, but they also have cadmium and beryllium. Depending on the manufacturer in the coating on the panel. We're also always looking about how we affect stormwater with outside storage or processing or shredding. We know that we affect only not only water, but soil quality with outside storage. And then fires are the most destructive, of course, because we have not only the emissions, but we end up with what's pretty much a toxic waste mess, actually, if it's after a facility of ours burns. And we know that we're going to impact the soil, air, and actually we can actually... We also look at things as, as tiny as air emissions, but noise and light pollution from our facility. How do we affect the community? What resources are we using? Do we create any wastewater in our process? Do we use any hazardous chemicals to clean screens or manage or wipe down components? Is there a less hazardous material we can use to clean material up? And then do we have a potential for spills? Sometimes the big flat screen TVs, the projector teams, uh, TVs have some oil in them that helps keep them cool. How do we manage that? Or how do we manage glass from a CRT breaking? And how do we clean that up? Or if a bulb breaks, how do we manage that? Do we have a mercury cleanup kit? So we're looking at all of the ways we might handle environmental issues. So 
the occupational hazards from health and safety is the foundation of a system. And whenever they can have an effect on worker health and safety, we need to monitor those. So like the aspects and hazards, we also have hazards and risks. So it's any situation where we might have a potential for harm in terms of human injury or ill health. So when we talk about injuries, it's damage or harm. And when we're talking about ill health, we're talking about physical or mental condition arising from a situation and a work activity. So like environmental, it's the same basic things that we're worried about, right? We're worried about dust from a shredder, noise from the equipment, potentials for cuts and handling of glass or other sharp objects, injury from moving equipment or forklifts. I had someone just last month get pinned between a Gaylord and a forklift. And then also potential injury from electricity, meaning from the electrical boxes, but also from the batteries themselves. So a risk is the combination of the likelihood, the possibility something might happen, and the, ex and the severity of the injury. And that's how we determine what kind of controls we'll have in place. So for example, a small cut, I'm not as worried about the possibility of a small cut, but the possibility of somebody having a, something crush their foot or embed in their eye or chop their finger off, those are going to be things that I'm going to be more worried about and have more controls in place to protect the worker. And again, we're going to be looking at normal and abnormal operations. So normal everyday work, we may not have that many issues. But if there is a lithium battery fire or if somebody arrives to work and they're really tired from the night before and they're not watching what when they back up the forklift or the same for um, it's an unusual day and that you might get a, a very big load of material and so people are moving in all sorts of directions. So your traffic management means you have to make sure nobody hits one another or runs over each other. Um, things that happen outside of the workplace, storms, fires, earthquakes, how do you manage those and what's your plan in case those occur? And then human behavior. And then when I talk about that, I mean, you know, we know from, from our industry, just from studies we've done, that Wednesdays at 5 o'clock or 4 o'clock are the times when people get injured the most because they've already worked three days, they're tired, and that's when things tend to happen. They don't tend to happen on Monday mornings, they happen on Wednesdays because that's when people are tired. And then we want to make sure we're planning again for potential emergencies, and we talked about that before, meaning fires and spills. So what are some of the controls that we have in place? Well, we can have good written programs that talk about how we're going to manage any potential injuries, what's our process, who's in charge of making sure that the person who's injured is well cared for, do we have first aid kits on site, how close are they, how available are they, do we have eye wash kits if somebody gets something in their eye, and if we have those, are they easily accessible or do I have I was at a facility last week in the UK that had a battery charging station on the floor and the eye wash kit right above it. And I said to them, if I have something in my eye, I'm not going to be able to see very well and I have to trip over the batteries to get to the eye wash station, that seems dangerous. So how do we set up situations in our facility that make it easy for our employees to take care of themselves if something happens? What kind of training do we have? And again, I, depending on the facilities, I see some people that do emergency drills three and four times a year and others that always forget to do them. So it's important to do them even though the employees know and they're planned for because once you do them, you see how well or how poorly you actually respond to an emergency alarm. So sometimes everybody knows they're supposed to meet out in the front part of the building, but they scatter all over the place. And you need to know what you do, what your company does, how do they react, and how do you make sure, again, as we talked about before, you have everybody out of the building. What's the reporting structure for that? Same with signs. Signs are really important, especially exit signs that glow in the dark or have some way to be lit up in the dark. So I always tell people, imagine that you have somebody working here at night, it's a night shift for some reason, and the electricity goes out and there's a fire, how would they know to find the door? How would they be able to see the door? 
We also look at our what we call engineering controls. Do we have things to make sure we take the inherent unsafe conditions out of our workplace? So for example, if we're shredding, do we have a way to capture dust emissions? As opposed to putting a dust mask on somebody, do we have an engineering control in place that manages the dust from the shredding process? And then the simplest way to deal with a lot of risks is just to have what we call personal protective equipment, gloves, hard hat, eye protection. It doesn't mean you have to have that. <clears throat> For the most part, in most of our facilities, they aren't required. But if you are doing heavy lifting, if you are breaking things with hammers, any potential for any injury to your body, how can you protect your body to keep that from happening? And then what kind of emergency equipment do you have? Does the building have sprinklers? Do you have fire extinguishers nearby? Do you have fire hoses? What does that look like and what's your program to keep those things available but also full? For example, if you have fire extinguishers, how do you know that they're operable? You don't just buy a fire extinguisher and then four years later expect it to work. You need to make sure that every now and then you're inspecting the fire extinguisher and you know it's full and ready to go. So here are some of the things that we see in electronic recyclers that are hazards and risks from a health and safety standpoint. They're very similar to things we saw from an environmental, right? So we're looking at dust. We know that when we shred circuit boards, or circuit board containing devices, that we are looking at cadmium and beryllium and lead as being part of the things that you might be exposed to. We know that it's loud when we do shredding, so we don't want to have it so loud that we're actually destroying our employees' hearing. We want to make sure that we're guarding any moving parts that our employees might be close enough to that they could catch either their clothing or parts of their body. We also have to think about electricity, how we manage that hazardous energy. So for example, if I have to do some work on the shredder because it's broken down and I turn it off and I'm inside the shredder working on it, what's to prevent a, a fellow worker from walking up to that panel and saying, who turned the shredder off and turning it on? So what do we have in place to keep me from getting shredded up? And then we also know that our material be sometimes very sharp. So how do we prevent those kinds of things from happening to our workers? If we use forklifts, we're thinking about the emissions. If we use fuel propelled forklifts, we need to think about that. How do we manage traffic safety? How do we keep workers and visitors from being hit from forklifts? How do we keep forklifts from tipping over? Not being seat belted in a forklift is one of the leading causes of death for material handlers. I see people all the time on forklifts not using seat belts because it's a pain. They don't want to jump on and jump off and undo their forklift. However, when a forklift is going onto a truck and the truck has a floor with a hole in it and the floor breaks, the first thing that happens is that forklift tips over and you fall out before the forklift. So we want to make sure that you don't fall out before the forklift and you fall with the forklift. And the only way to do that is to be seat belted in. However, I see people riding forklifts all the time without seatbelts. So how do we keep them wearing their seatbelts? And then we also have the problem of objects falling from the forklifts onto visitors or workers if people aren't paying attention to what's going on around them. We also in our industry have a lot of cuts from sharp objects. Of course, not in reuse and refurbishment, but this is always more during teardown. And fire is probably, again, the most severe, and with a lithium battery, something we need to be very cognizant of. Mostly we're talking about the thermal combustion of lithium batteries, even in storage. So often I'll be at a site and I'll see a box of batteries and I'll see swollen batteries that have actually already smoldered that nobody even knew were compromised. So at least here in the States and in Canada, we're working to identify those types of batteries to isolate them using a spill absorbent or something to keep the smoke down, to, to make sure that they're not stored near other combustible materials, and most importantly also to tape the ends of those batteries to keep them from touching one another and setting one another off. We also always have to think about any falls from heights. I see people climbing up on stacks of material all the time. And ergonomics, meaning 
how often a certain body part is moved when we're lifting or changing or tearing something down. We call it repetitive motion. We're looking at lighting in facilities. Do our employees have enough light to be able to see where they're going? Is there backup lighting if there is an emergency and the electricity goes out? How do we prevent slips, trips, and falls? Oftentimes I see extension cords across aisleways and cardboard or pallets in places where it shouldn't be. We want to make sure that we have safe walking surfaces for our employees because the minute they're not paying attention and looking down at their feet, they're going to trip and fall. We also want to consider traffic movements at our sites. What our inbound looks like, what our outbound looks like, is there a good flow that prevents people from getting injured? Does it make sense? Do we have room for people to walk and also equipment to walk? Anywhere that equipment and people interface, we want to make sure that we're doing our best to keep them safe. And then do we have any hazardous materials on site? Do we have any acids or chemicals? We know we have some lead and mercury. How are we making sure that our employees are not exposed to that? And then depending where you live, you might have excessive heat or cold that your employees are exposed to. And how do you manage that? If it's very, very hot where you live, have you given shade to your workers? Do you have fans? Is there enough water? If it's really, really cold, how do you keep them from hypothermia? How do you keep workers warm? Once you look at those aspects and health issues, you're going to identify any regulatory requirements that might be in place in your area to make sure you're meeting those requirements. If you don't have regulations in your area, you're going to be looking to someone like us for best management practices around all of those aspects that we've identified. So it's really your responsibility to make sure that you have the resources to make sure the regulations are in place. And it's also a company's responsibility to protect worker health and safety. Saying you just didn't know really isn't fair, either to the workers or to the environment. So it is the responsibility of the company owner or the organization managing the industry to make sure you're doing things correctly. So where do we find regulation? So we always look at the internet. We look at local government websites and at NGO websites. You also can ask local officials for regulations. If you don't have regulations, you need to create a set of standards that make sense for your organization. And that's something I can help you with by giving you just basic worldwide common environmental health and safety standards to make sure that they're best management practices at your organization. You can also go to the Basel Treaty website to look at regulatory resources for importing and exporting. If you have an insurance company, I know a lot of people do in OECD countries, they are very good at helping you manage worker health and safety requirements and will often come visit for free. And then any local fire response also will help you with basic fire safety and ideas on keeping your workers safe in emergencies. So it's important if you do have regulations that fit around our industry that you look them up and understand them and that you have somebody in-house who's responsible for managing those types of requirements. If you have an insurance company to help you with it, please use them or have a third party person from an NGO or a consultant to come and do a one-time walk around of your facility. I've also helped people do this virtually just using FaceTime or WhatsApp and done a tour of their site to look at things and help them with ideas on making things more safe at their site. So these are the regulations that typically are associated with our industry, hazardous waste generation, shipping requirements, storm water, air emissions, noise and air monitoring, fire protection emergency planning, export regulations to and from OECD and non-OECD countries, and health and safety. And then, of course, the hazardous waste that we see in our facilities, which are different types of battery chemi uh, chemistries, mercury-containing equipment, the bulbs in those, and then CRT glass, which we see much less of now, but I don't know how much you guys are seeing over there. And then when we look at hazardous waste, how we store it, label it, whether we inspect it to make sure there aren't any issues going on from time to time, 
how we manifest or send them with bill of ladings, and how we package, especially for batteries for transportation. So common things we see in our industry are something like lockout, tagout, which is when I gave the example of working on the baler or the shredder and somebody accidentally turning it on. How do we prevent something like that happening? Do we train our employees to drive forklifts? Do we have a set of safety standards around best management practices for forklifts? How do we manage flammable materials? So if we have chemicals that we use for cleaning, how do we store that material? Do we have hearing conservation? Do we have noise monitoring? Do we have any respiratory protection? Do we, if we're doing shredding, do we make sure employees wear dust masks? How do we manage that? And then personal protective equipment. How do we decide if people need gloves or glasses for each operation? And again, we talk about walking, working surfaces. How do we make sure that we have a safe working area for our employees? If we have any type of moving equipment, how do we guard pinch points for our employees for injury? Air emissions, ergonomics, meaning lifting, you know, if they're standing all day long doing a repetitive motion, eventually their elbows, wrists, neck, backs are going to give out. How do we prevent those types of injuries? How do we help with lifting and then confined spaces, which you would only have if you have shredders? One of the things that people do is they do a monthly safety inspection to make sure that their equipment, their exit, their storage, their labeling, their fire extinguishers, their walkway are up to grade and just that they're safe. It's one way to just kind of do an ongoing review and making sure you're doing the best you can. You also should train at new hire basic emergency response, basic equipment procedures, safety, fire extinguishers, even for temps or volunteers. Everybody needs to know the basic health and safety requirements at your facility. And the suggestion is to have a designated employee responsible for just this, as well as other things but they should be reporting to the owner or the CEO. Make sure that you have the resources to train them. Sometimes you need to bring in a third party to get a review and take regulatory responsibility seriously because it's, a, if it's about sustainability in the long run, keeping our employees safe, keeping the environment safe, keeping the resources well managed. Okay, are there any questions? Thank you, Kelly. Um, so I would like to open up the floor now to um, all participants and raise, uh, please raise your questions. I'm sure there are quite a lot. There was um, an, a very good uh, summary of things that have to, um, taken into account when you um, manage a facility. Um, so please uh, just raise your hand or uh, speak up. Yes, Daniel. Hey, so thanks for a, a great presentation, uh, Kelly, on, on these aspects of health and safety. Uh, a lot of the, the, the recyclers in the call, I, I guess, are working in a slightly different context to the USA and, and Canada. Uh, I don't know if you have um, had a chance to, to visit many um, facilities in other countries uh, outside of the OECD and have any experience of um, how easy it is for, for these kind of countries um, or people situated in these countries to um, implement environmental health and safety. And if you're looking maybe at uh, someone who's formalizing from a more informal context um, where there was no health and safety before and then they're moving towards uh, implementing um, safe processes, where would you say is the best place to start? Which, which kind of characteristics should you focus on um, to really um, yeah, move forward with your environmental health and safety. Thank you, that's a good question. I, I knew when I was presenting this, and yes, I I travel all over the world, so I see all sorts of um, recyclers. I knew when I was presenting this that I wanted to give a very high level, which is why I talked about the aspects and hazards and the risks and impacts. And 
And really what we're trying to look at is we think about our building and our operation as a unit, and we have to look at all of the ways our building and our operation interact with the environment and the health and safety of our workers. So in, with a lack of a regulatory environment, we need to think about how our operation affects air, water, noise, our employees, and how we keep our employees safe. So that's why I suggested that you use either an NGO or you can also do um, FaceTime or WhatsApp video with me of the facility and I can help give you some ideas. But the very basic foundation are the things that I mentioned in the presentation. We're looking at fire safety, emergency safety, worker protection from cuts, hazards, air, noise, um, so even without a regulatory environment in place and a more informal recycling sector, those are still the same things you're going to be considering. So I've worked with people in Africa and also in India. And again, we're looking at the most basic things, right? So how we make the building safe, how we make the operation safe, how we have working and walking surfaces, how we manage any pinch points in any moving equipment, and how we reduce injuries just from cuts, lifting, um, protect our eyes and hands. And those are the, that really that is what I was giving was the most basic things that we would be considering. I hope that's helpful. And I'm also happy to, like I said, do virtual walk arounds of facilities with some of you if that's helpful. And thank you for that offer, Kelly. I was also wondering if you maybe have kind of a um, checklist or um, a list of things that um, that you should consider when you're managing a facility or when you're moving from a rather informal operation to a more formalized operation um, so that people could look at and, and, and check if they, for example, when you say they should have like clean uh, walkthroughs, how that would look like and um, what are really the measures um, there. So, so just a, a list of basic, basic things to consider. I do, yeah, I have a um, monthly inspection checklist that I'll update for you, Lisbeth, and make it more um, international and not regulatory based. So I think that'll be helpful too. I'll leave myself a note and work on that this week and send it to you so you can send it to your participants. That's great, thanks a lot. Uh, hi, this is uh, Wayne uh, from St. Lucia. Um, not so, well. The question is: um, You mentioned that you've done some work in uh, Latin America. Um, are there any um, e-waste recycling facilities in Latin America that are ISO 14001 certified that you all work with? Um, there are in Brazil, Colombia, Chile. Uh, I just finished with a company in Dominican Republic. There are some in Mexico, Costa Rica, Argentina, um, Venezuela. So one place you can go to look is on the R2 Siri website, and I'll send Elizabeth that link. Those are companies listed there, and you can look up Latin America, Central America, Mexico that have certification to R2, but also 14,000 and 18,000, and there are actually quite a few. So we did a project with DirecTV and Sims Metal Recycling, and we helped eight recyclers get certified, and that was all in South America. And then I also helped a company in Panama. So there are actually several that have completed that process. All right, thank you. You're welcome. In this uh, process that you uh, just mentioned to certify different recyclers, uh, how much effort was involved and uh, visits? Um, if you could maybe elaborate a bit. Sure. So the project um, was to help them become R2 certified, which included certification to ISO 14000, which is the environmental standard international, and then the health and safety standard, OSAC 18000, which has now changed to ISO 45001. 
not to confuse matters even more, but it has a new name. Um, so we went to do a gap analysis, and I spent a day on site looking at a lot of the things that we just talked about, about things they would need to work on from an environmental health and safety uh, management standpoint to get them prepared. And then we provided all the documents for them, and we worked with them virtually over a webinar software for six to, say, 12 weeks to customize the format to their facility. And then we did an internal audit to make sure they were ready for their actual certification body audit. And then they had two separate certification body audits that are called a stage one and a stage two to make sure that they were doing everything appropriately and then they received their certification. The problem with getting certified is it's very expensive and so it's cost prohibitive for a lot of nonprofits or smaller recyclers. It's not, you know, the, the part with the consultant is expensive, but we had given that for free in this particular instance. But the certification body audit process is very expensive. And that's the part that makes it um, harder to attain. And it's unfortunate, but it's uh, the certification body audit process is just is expensive. Okay, thanks. You're I had welcome. another question, maybe um, on uh, the role of insurance companies. So, in, in many of these countries, um, are these recyclers also picked up by insurers? And what kind of role can you expect from an insurer? Is it a kind of general insurance, or uh, how does this come into play? I would check with your insurance companies if they include in their policy anything that has to do with environmental health and safety it's to their benefit to help you prevent any of those types of things from happening at your site because otherwise there's a possibility of a claim. So in more formalized recycling situations, for example, the insurance company will come and bring an industrial hygienist who will do air testing or noise monitoring. They'll also come and help them with spill programs or do an evaluation of the facility from a health and safety standpoint to make sure they're meeting basic international requirements for health and safety. It depends on what your policy covers. It just makes sense for them to do what they call risk analysis to prevent things from happening so that you don't have, you know, so that you don't file a claim. So it just depends on your insurance company and, and what services they offer. But oftentimes people don't think to ask them and they do have risk advisors on staff. Okay, thanks. Sure, I, my, my goal when I ask people to use their insurance companies is it's usually free and we're always looking for as much free information we can get so we don't have to pay professionals to help us with this stuff. We want to see, we want to use the resources that are already available to us, right? So that that's my goal in mentioning that to you all. Are there some other questions? Um, I mean, can you um, you mentioned the the project that you had in Latin America, where you, where the um, the recyclers got certified even to R2, and you mentioned there the timeline, but um, you also said that it's uh, very expensive to get certified, and I think that's really um, a shame that this certification is is so expensive. But um, if we are not looking at really getting the certification, but rather um, just implementing um, a good um, management system and health and safety measures um, for a facility, what do you think, or usually what is the, um, the timeline, um, according to your experience, for um, implementing a, a good system? You know, the biggest challenge I see with doing this on an informal level is that it's it's hard to find any regulations that might pertain to your facility, but also it's hard to find a format in which to implement. So I've had people 
look on the internet and find ISO systems. I have one friend that didn't pay a consultant for anything. She found an ISO system for the city of Hong Kong for 14,000 and 18,000. And she just took the documents and implemented them to her facility. But it took a lot of time. And so the problem with this stuff is it's really boring. And most of us are operational people. So we're out on the floor doing activities. And we don't really have the time to spend sitting at a desk creating these written programs. And so you're very limited in that sense when you don't have a consultant come in and give you forms. So you have to be really dedicated and want to take the time to look on the internet because essentially you're, you're looking for other people's systems, and there are many online, and customizing them to your site. So I know it can be done because I have seen it be done, but it, you also need somebody that's sort of, um, um, what's the word, sort of an administrative nerd. I, nerd's a very American word, but you have to be sort of a person that loves to just research and find things and then customize them to your facility. And it doesn't need to be complicated. You just need to keep very simple health and safety programs, but without the access to just the whole format, you're gonna to have to create that piece by piece. And if I were gonna say how to start, I would suggest having an emergency plan as a very basic part of your system. So the process and information about how you deal with fires, 